Like, we're, like they're going to be like a pinball once they get in that thing. That's these sharks are going to bap them all around the aquatica. So Carter Blake's let me down in this clip a little bit. I think not only does he he walks without falling and he kind of is boisterous and that I don't know it just throws me off. I don't like it. Maybe he's planning to put let's say for instance Janice and Scoggins in the sub and send them up first, and he's expecting the shark to go for the sub. Meanwhile, he's just going to swim out and survive and get through on his own. <laughs> he's using them as a distraction. <laughs> Because that's well, Scoggins, get the sub. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was gonna say, like, he does try to bring up, like, I mean, we don't see a ton of it, but he does try to bring up concerns a lot, and no one listens to him. So maybe at this point, he's just like, I don't really have time to, like, deal with anybody else's opinion right now, because all of your opinions have got us into this mess. Like, it's one of those. Like, that's a great point. Yeah. Alright, you yeah. just turned my entire argument around. <laughs> yeah, I like him sacrificing other people for his own survival, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, it makes sense. He's tired of it because he keeps telling people like, "Hey, we need to put the fence higher." Are these what's right. going on with these sharks? We're like, we shouldn't do this. It's, we're not ready, and then no one listens. So then he's just then he becomes all business. And later, he's like, "Maybe don't stand so close to that pool." Yeah, Susan at one point is like, "Hope you like your job," and like blackmails him. So I'm sure at this point he's just like, "Whatever." If you want any expertise, I'm the only person here that can handle these sharks. Let's just do whatever I can. Well, the the problem with Susan then was her inflection. Like she, she made it sound like she was threatening him, but she, he was. Yes, she was. Well, no, I know, but she, but she also, she could have said the same sentence in a different way. It would have been perfectly fine because if they didn't do the test when they were supposed to, yesterday, then he would have lost his job because Franklin was shutting the whole thing down. So he need they he was concerned about doing the test so early. But she just be like, I hope you like your job, and it's like, oh, seriously, if you don't you want to keep your job, we have to do the test. So she's just, <laughs> just a, bit more, a bit more pleading in the voice, and it would have been fine. That's why she comes off as a villain. She is the villain, but she doesn't help herself. So why is the bird called Bird? Why isn't he given it a name? I think that's cute. Yeah, Bird. Yeah, like, that's what you would... I don't. I mean, like, it seems realistic almost. Like, he didn't bother to pick up a name. He just kind of likes this bird. He's like, hey, bird, and just starts to chat. And I was saying that in this movie as a whole, LL Cool J's acting is like... I know that a lot of people remember him from this movie. He's, like, my favorite character. But his acting is, like, kind of underrated because he literally has to, like, act against nothing, like a bird. He doesn't even talk to people half the movie. Also, just a side note, the fact that no one remembers he's in this, whatever you want to call it, no one, like, remembers him or mentions, like, hey, maybe we should check on him, is really upsetting to me. But he does a really good job, I think, like, bringing levity to the movie and becoming this, like, audience surrogate that... Is like looking back, like I was watching, like watching it just the other day. I was like, wow, he does like a really good job of this when it's not really, it, it's a, it's a thing you wouldn't expect him to really perform terribly well at, not being an actor. He does a great job being like the underdog action hero in throughout the movie. And I love his, like he really expresses how cold the water is mm, yeah. in a way that not a lot of other people do. Like he has like very solid lip quivers. Well, LL and his lips. Yes, that's true. A plus lip quivering. Yeah, that's why they got him. And it it would have been cold because I I tried to find out how like kind of ocean temperatures off the coast of California in November. Oh, it's it's cold. Yeah, it'd be about fifty degrees Fahrenheit or ten degrees centigrade. I mean, the Pacific Ocean is always a lot colder. I mean, at that temperature, you can last about one to two hours before uh, exhaustion or becoming unconscious sets in, and about six hours you die. Yeah. So, yeah, he'd be chilly. The scenes with him, especially in the hallway, really remind me so much of Titanic, too. Yeah. Especially with, like, the lights flashing. Yeah, we, yeah. They like, shot in the we, same place. Yeah, we were yeah, just talking about that after. I was like, can you imagine, like, filming these? They must have sucked. But I guess it was probably better. My, my guess is that it was probably better with uh, Harlan versus James Cameron. But, but apparently, Elo Kude was the least complaining actor amongst the cast. Uh, Rennie Harlan said in, in the commentary that, like, of all the actors, he complained the least. He just, just kind of got on with it. I yeah. buy that. Yeah. I, I love when, when he's trying to coax the bird off of the pot, and he's doing that real forced smile. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, that's what I'm saying. Like, he's very charming in the natural way that I can see be going a whole different way that's, like, bad. But it's just, like, he's naturally, like, a likable person. So in these scenarios, like, it works out really well. Like, him talking to himself doesn't seem silly it doesn't seem like it's made up for the audience it kind of seems natural yeah and he he's 
he drops a lot of religious stuff throughout the movie, obviously, but like it's balanced out enough where he that's not just his one note character trait. And I like yeah. too, it's sort of a personal struggle that's like also kind of believable. Like you know those people that are like somewhat hyper religious but not really following the book all the time. So like he's basically like he he almost like broadcasts all of his like issues like Clearly, he's got a wandering eye. He says he's drinking the bottle. Like, that bit with the bottle is really, really funny. And, like, all of it kind of plays into, like, oh, this it's not, like, it's a bit of a caricature, but it's not so bad that it's eye-rolling. Like, you really like this guy. Yeah, if, if when Stellan Scarsgo and when Jim smashed through the window, and if that took out the entire rest of the cast, and the rest of the film was just Preacher trying to get out from these three sharks and also dealing oh, with yeah. his own demons, that's an awesome film. <laughs> Yeah, it is. yeah. <laughs> it's like the shallows with LL in a, <laughs> just underwater, yeah. Yeah. And so I worked in a movie theater when this movie came out. And I remember going in during the big scenes and the entire audience was just like I've never heard this before in my life. Yeah. People were just cheering, going, Go LL like people yeah. were yelling, Go LL. So well, it, you know, if you so didn't funny. like the guy, right? So I think he he's super charming and I love that you said he acts on his own and does a great job. I mean I've never even thought about that and you nailed it. But yeah, people love this character because they were screaming in the theater. Everybody was rooting for him. It was it cool. Also, yeah, it, and it also, like, I was, like, kind of convinced, like, there was someone black in the writing staff, which turned out not to be true. But they do very cleverly subvert, like, horror expectations. Like, they say it out loud a couple times in the movie. But it's done with his character in a way that's, like, like, a lot of what works about this movie and, like, a lot of what's memorable about this movie is the way they introduce a lot of, like, surprise moments are genuinely surprising. It's, like, kind of similar to Alien, where, like, you're not expecting certain scenes to happen, and they just really stick with you. So there's, like, Sam Jackson's part, like, the Stellan Sarsgaard part. Like, all these parts are very, like, jarring when they happen in the movie in a really effective way. And I think that they do that a lot with his character as well, where they give you somebody to root for, but they know that you know the tropes. So they're trying to, like, subvert it in very, like, almost, like, interesting ways, like, subtle ways that aren't super overt. And I really like, I don't know, like, I think that's why his character is, is like, outside of the bounds of what he rightfully should be on paper. Like, it makes it more interesting, I guess. No, yeah, absolutely. Because he should be fodder, right? Yeah, you never it, expect him to win that kitchen fight. It should be the guy that just says, like, hi-ho, and, like, you know, like, oh, he's the funny one. But it's not really, you know, they, they do a couple of things even narratively, like plot-wise, that are like, oh, that's that was clever, like the way they did that. And I, I really enjoyed that. Even by horror or uh, like creature feature logic, it feels like at this point in the movie, we're sort of due for the next death scene. Right. So it, it's another play on that too, because you fully expect that we're, we need to sacrifice another person. And it would make sense for it to be the guy that's off on his own. Yeah. I mean, we, this is the next death scene. There is a huge death in this scene. I feel like you're not taking the bird's role seriously, Jess. Yeah. R.I.P. bird. Thank you. Rennie uh, Harlan gave a really nice eulogy to this not. bird. <laughs> Thank goodness we got rid of that parrot finally. No, but then he said he was a trooper and he's like, that, that parrot was good. He's like, he did good work. Like he, yeah. he complimented the parrot, Rennie Harlan, in this. Yeah, after he said, thank goodness we killed it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, have you ever been around a bird? Yes. Oh, it's not fun. But if you, if you think about other, like, uh, like standard disaster movies, the character with a pet. The, that character normally dies. I'm thinking of uh, there's a, a character with a little dog in 2012. I don't know why my brain has gone to 2012 first. That's a terrible place for it to go first. Daylight. Talked about Daylight a few weeks ago. There's a couple with with a dog there. One of the couple dies, but the dog survives, and the dog survives in 2012. The dog always lives. That's the the rule of filmmaking. But here okay. they they kill the pet because it's a bird. No, no one likes birds. No, 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 no. <laughs> so okay, this is genius though, Jed. So they don't all they do, the dogs do not always live. And I feel like the movies you remember the most, like, there's always that, like, joke that people are more upset when a dog dies than when, like, a person dies, like, in a slasher or something, you know? Like, think about, like, Hollow Man or, like, even something like John Wick. It's like a, everybody understands why you're going on a killing rampage because you killed that puppy. Okay, so, this is, like, kind of brilliant because it's almost, like, more endearing to LL because nobody really likes birds, like... Bird people that have, like, a big connection with birds, I feel like, are fewer and farther in between than people that have, like, dogs or cats. So, as the audience, we're like, oh, haha, that bird's kind of cute and funny. And honestly, the bird's almost comic relief, because it just says naughty words sometimes, and that's funny. 
So when the bird goes, it's almost more endearing because LL tried to save the bird, but we don't really care about the bird. Does that make sense? Yeah. We already care about him because he does. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. I was blowing my eyes out when that thing died. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So while right before starting this, we watched it with fellow French Toast Sunday member slash my husband, Rob, and it came to light that Rob had never seen this movie before, what? which blew my mind. I know. He doesn't live. And he, he had great reactions throughout this movie, but when the bird died, he was very upset. <laughs> he was kind of upset. I feel about that. <laughs> he did not care for that at all. He did that classic, like, light up of his eyes when he was like, really? <laughs> How, what happened with the Sam Jackson scene? That was the only thing where he, he knew... He said because of Chappelle's show that Samuel Jackson was going to die, but he wasn't quite sure when it was going to happen. But as the scene was gearing up, he was like, I think this is when it's going to happen. <laughs> but he didn't expect the shark to jump out. I know this is random, but y'all got me thinking about other movies. So, like, Alien, whenever someone's off looking for Jonesy, they get killed. Mm-hmm. Or it's always the person on their own that just gets wiped out. So, once again, they're kind of subverting that. You have this whole separate adventure where he keeps living. Yeah. Yeah, this it does, like, oddly skewer a lot of those tropes that you're really, really used to. And even watching it now, I'm like, if they remade this exactly and, like, put it out, the way they, like, all the deaths are pretty awesome by, I don't know, like, they're all unexpected. Or they happen in, like, a pace at which you're not used to and therefore is, like, very rewarding as a viewer. Yeah, and they're mean, too, which I love. Yeah, I, I like that, too. I like that they're, like, dirty. <laughs> This, this this shark is, they're not messing around. Yeah. During this scene, I was putting myself in LL Cool J's shoes. And I was like, there is no way that I could survive this scene. One, I am over a foot shorter than LL Cool J. <laughs> so I would have been completely submerged at this point underwater. And, like, how he's walking around with this axe and swimming around with this axe, there's no way that I would not accidentally inflict harm upon myself. <laughs> And his chef's coat has got yeah. to be so heavy at this point yes. that I just, there's no way. There's no way that I could get around. He, he was that for the rest several, of the film. I know. He commented <laughs> several times about how, like, he needs to shed layers. Because that is not, yeah. Has anyone ever been in the water, like, with clothing on? like full clothing? Oh, yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's awful. It's like the worst <laughs> feeling of, I've ever had in my life. It's so hard to move. So I was just like, man, please take the coat off. I also feel like if he had taken his coat off, he probably was underneath those layers wearing, like, a very skin-tight tank top that would have been very cinematic. I would have enjoyed that, yeah. In the Deepest Bluest video, and he's wearing a nice, like, Uh a sleeveless shirt. So at least he has that. You've already got Carter with his sleeveless wetsuit. I'm not saying they shouldn't have done this, maybe just visually (laughs) to distinguish character costumes and things. They wanted to keep them more different. Perhaps, from a costume perspective. They didn't want us to forget that he was the cook. Yes, exactly. Carter Blake would do horribly if he was being chased by a shark, because he'd just be tripping. Yeah. Yeah. Like, slipping. Right? Imagine that scene. He was just diving (laughs) and falling everywhere. Rob noticed it, and after that, it was like you could play a drinking game for that. (laughs) He just It would be so easy for the shark. Yeah. He would just have to r- ride the thing around the corridors. Would that be an interesting scene? Like, preachers fighting a shark, and in the background, you see Carter flying by on the back of another shark. Wee! <laughs> 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 that, that sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, one aspect of LLQJ, it's not a problem, uh, I suppose, but when, when he's startled by the bird on top of the, the shelves, he just makes a series of noises... Like goes, ah, e, oh, ah, ah, oh. And it's just, it's a real, <laughs> just listen to me in isolation. It's, I, I want to have been in the recording booth when he recorded. So just pretend you've been started by a bird up on a metal, metal tower. <laughs> Make some random noises. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I noticed that too. Yeah, just the, ah, ooh, ah. And I, I also, another credit to him, when he falls backwards on that shelf, he kind of looks like a goober. And so at yeah. the time, he was just this massive name. Yeah. And, I, I, I liked how he wasn't afraid to make himself sort of look bad. I, not bad, but scared and worried and kind of gooberish. That's another thing I dug about his performance, the way he felt. He did that in Halloween H2O, too, when he yeah, played Ronnie. 
there is like I don't know what this would be called. I don't know what this, this characteristic, this touchstone is. But like it's largely like the reason the rock is like the most you know profitable.